This is Hope Awakens. I'm glad you're with me. We're deep into week two now. Next time we meet, Friday night, our subject will be Beyond the Light. We've all become very much aware of our own mortality in recent times. Healthy, strong people have been encouraged not to socialize with others in order to avoid an illness that has claimed many lives. People haven't been shaking hands with other people. We've been told we're not able to go to places we normally would go. And that's because we are aware now, maybe like never before, that life is fragile. So Friday, we look at all that. And I want you to know we're adding an extra presentation this week. Saturday morning at 11 Eastern. It'll be re-aired, re-shown at 2 p.m. Eastern. The subject is a planet in lockdown. If you've ever thought that what we've been going through lately is interesting, you'll really find Saturday morning's presentation fascinating. I hope you won't miss it, and I apologize if in some way it doesn't work with your schedule. Saturday night, the new normal, a world without fear. And when I talk about a world without fear, I am not kidding. That day is coming and you want to know all about it. Greetings tonight to our friends in Wichita, Kansas, the home of McConnell Air Force Base. Joyce is in Centerburg, Ohio, northeast of Columbus. Welcome to our friends joining us from Washougal, Washington, Butte Valley, California, kind of between Oroville and Paradise. Fresno, California, Deer Lodge, Tennessee, Armucci, Georgia, and Arlington, Texas. I'm more than glad you're here with us. Thank you for being part of Hope Awakens. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written. Welcome to Hope Awakens. Now, be sure you visit hopeawakens.org where you'll find resources and previous presentations and the opportunity to send us a prayer request and you will be prayed for. And it's there at Hope Awakens that you can submit your questions. Now, to ask your questions, as always, here's Doug Naar. Doug, thanks for joining me. Hey, John, it's good to be here at Hope Awakens and also with our viewers. We've got a lot of good questions tonight, like we have been every night. And so this is the first one. Now, God says in Exodus 20, 13, thou shalt not kill, but yet the Israelites killed their enemies. Can you explain? Yes, I can. Exodus 20, 13 says thou shalt not kill. The intent is thou shalt not murder. That's the most accurate translation. So war wouldn't be uh, considered murder, particularly when God... Uh, commanded somebody to go forward. So that you'll find is not a contravention of the sixth commandment. Is there more power if more people are praying for the same thing at the same time? Well, I don't know if you'd say more power because the effectual fervent prayer of one righteous person avails much. However, more people praying, the better it is. No question about it. God is now being spoken to by many, many people. Sure, I don't know whether I want to say more power, but But sure, the more praying, absolutely. The more the merrier. The Bible says that Jesus was in the tomb three days and three nights. Now, if Jesus died on Friday night and resurrected on Sunday, doesn't that make that two nights? Well, okay, good question. Uh, What we're dealing with is something called inclusive reckoning. We don't see it too much in a Western mind, but in the Middle Eastern mind, it was very common. So even a part of a day was considered a day and a night. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three days and three nights. It's how time was reckoned. Now, the Bible says many things about the duration of Jesus' stay in the grave. It says he would be raised the third day. In another place, it says he would be raised after three days, which could, of course, be four days, five days, six days, seven days. So don't get hung up on this. It's clear Jesus went into the grave, the tomb, on the day we call Good Friday, and he came out on the day we refer to very commonly as Easter Sunday. It translates that as three days and three nights. It's okay. Is it a sin to hate Satan? Oh, I don't know if it's a sin, but I don't think it's very wise because if you're going to hate Satan, before long you'll be hating somebody else. But uh, to despise, to loathe, to be against everything he stands for, it's hard to see how you'd feel differently. Now, John, we have a live question from one of our viewers. So let's go to the cameras. Okay, I think this is Justin in Kentucky. Hey, Justin, and uh, what's your question tonight? My question is, my extended family feels that I am in bondage 
under the law of God. I tell him I keep it not because I feel obligated to keep his commandments, but because I love him and I want to keep his commandments. How do I keep testifying and, and witnessing, showing okay. him that God's will for us is to keep his commandments? Okay, great question. I'm going to give you a verse here, Romans chapter 3 and verse 31, where Paul said this, do we then make void the law through faith? He said, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So Justin, you know, the, 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 the questions about how do I convince my family, that's tough. Live your convictions, be the Christian God has called you to be, pray, and when you get an opportunity to share, you'll show where Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You'll show Romans 13 verse 10, which says that love is the fulfilling of the law. So always point this thing back to love for God, Jesus living his life in you, Jesus and his disciples also keeping the commandments. But this is a matter of love and love simply develops obedience and faithfulness in a person's life. Justin, thanks for joining us. I'm really glad you took time to be here tonight. Thank you. Thanks for being part of Hope Awakens. Thanks, Doug. Because Jesus had a human mother, was Jesus born into sin? Okay, we wanna be careful with this. Jesus was born into a sinful world. His mother was a sinner, Jesus was not. He was sinless. Uh, the Bible says, in sin did my mother conceive me. But again, you don't wanna make Jesus uh, an angel, he was not. You don't wanna make Jesus a sinner, he was not that. So. You just wanna be careful how you tread through this one. Jesus was born a sinless uh, individual into a sinful world. And thank God through his life, Jesus never sinned, not once, not even by a thought. Therefore, he could be our perfect sacrifice. If the Sabbath is Saturday, then why do we go to worship God on Sunday? Great question. And I will answer that question tonight. You're in the right place. Can you please explain the continuity of the weekly cycle? You know, some people say there's no way to determine that the same seventh day Sabbath we celebrate now is the same in the past. Oh yeah, sure there is. You know what, I'll bring back a document that will uh, help demonstrate that that is so. Um, what we know is this, the only time people get worried about the continuity of the weekly cycle is when you start talking about what we discussed last night. There's no question at all that the day that we call Saturday today is the day that was the seventh day in the time of Jesus. For it to be otherwise, you'd have to entertain the idea of the entire Jewish nation somehow losing track of time. That did not happen. You can be sure that the day today we call the first day, second day, third day, those were the same first day, second day, third, day, third days back in the time of Jesus and even further back. Now, in the Sabbath commandment, it mentions everybody in the immediate family except the wife. Now, it has been explained to me that the Lord was addressing both husband and the wife in the Ten Commandments. Now, if this is true, why does the Tenth Commandment specifically mention not coveting your neighbor's wife? Well, it may well have been addressed to the husband and the wife, but keep in mind the society was a patriarchal society. So there was a lot of he, a lot of presuming that this is being addressed to the man as the head of the home and the household. That's most likely why it's that way. How do I help my sister to understand that Saturday is the day God set aside for his created beings to worship him? She believes that uh, the day is Sunday in spite of all the Bible scriptures I read to her. Okay, well, you know, there are a lot of very genuine Christians who love God who feel that way. If you've shown someone the Bible, it's, there's not a lot more you can do other than live a Christian life before that person and pray for that person. But one thing you might like to do is point your sister to last night's presentation at hopeawakens.org and maybe that'll help her see her way through some of the questions she has. Now we know that the Jews still keep Saturdays the Sabbath. If that's so, then why do the majority of the Christians keep Sunday? Okay, I'll use the same answer as before. You're in the right place. I'll answer that question tonight. Now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, it talks about how Jesus came to fulfill the law. Now, some people use the word fulfill or define the word fulfill as meaning that Jesus came to complete the law at the cross. Yeah, well, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, which means destroy it. No, Jesus didn't do that. You can only, you look through the New Testament and the commandments are repeated again and again. You look in the book of Revelation, blessed are they that keep or do his commandments. 
The problem we have is when people get hung up on obedience as though somehow that's how we're saved. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, and that will never change. Obedience to God happens as an inevitability. It's what happens when Jesus gets your heart and lives His life in you. If Jesus lives in you, He will lead you in the paths of righteousness. We're saved by grace, but we're saved unto good works, Paul said in Romans, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Now, in the book of Genesis, Satan is mentioned there, and he reappears throughout the Bible. Why does God wait to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, to explain Satan and the origin of sin and the war in heaven? Well, I don't know that God does. You know, it's there in Genesis, it's in Isaiah, it's in Ezekiel. The book of Job shows us graphically. So I don't think he just waits until the last book. Do you know why Jesus was nailed to the cross and the other two were tied? Oh, I don't think they were. Everybody was nailed to the cross. That's how people were crucified back then. How do we know for sure that the seventh day is a Sabbath? Is it possible? It could be Sunday, it could be Tuesday, Wednesday. How do we know with certainty that Saturday is the seventh day Sabbath? Thank you, great questions tonight, Doug. I think this will be our last one. <clears throat> we know because we looked last night and we discovered that Jesus died on the preparation day. That's the day that we call Good Friday today. And then he was raised on the first day of the week, commonly referred to by many people as Easter Sunday. So he died on Friday. He rose on Sunday. The day in between in which Jesus was in the tomb was the Sabbath. What day is between Friday and Sunday? It can only be the day which in English we refer to as Saturday in Espanol, Sábado. There's just really no other way around it. Great questions. Get your questions to us at hopeawakens.org and we would deeply appreciate it. I have a special guest tonight. He is a good friend of mine. He is an international speaker, international evangelist. His name is Pastor Mark Finley. Mark, thank you so much for joining me and being part of Hope Awakens. I am delighted to join you, John. Just absolutely thrilled to be part of this program, excited about what God is doing through it is written. Well, I'd love to take a few moments and have you talk with me about spiritual growth. So, someone wants to grow spiritually, what should they do? Well, first, if you want to grow spiritually, you need a two things. One, a willing heart, and second, an informed mind. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, in the Bible, it says this in John 7, verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. So Jesus is revealing that first there is a willingness to do his will. John 8, verse 29 speaks about Jesus, and Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. So when we come to Christ and we want to grow spiritually, First, there's that willing spirit. That's that desire to say, God, whatever you want me to do, you just reveal it to me. Second is the informed mind. I may have a willing spirit, but I don't have a for informed mind. What do I mean by that? John 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. So the Bible filling our mind, giving us direction in our life, enables us to grow spiritually. Now, what advice do you have for someone who wants to grow in their knowledge of the Bible, who really wants to, to grow in their faith in God? What would you say? I would say don't let the things that you don't understand in the Bible keep you from appreciating the things you do understand. So, for example, take the book of John, begin to read the book of John chapter by chapter. When you read the book of John, you're going to come to case histories in the book of John and ask God to do for you what he did for those Bible characters. When you read in John 3 about Nicodemus and his being changed by the Spirit of God, when you read the man with the palsy in John chapter 5, don't worry about speed reading. Read slowly, and as you read it, say, God, do that for me. Now, in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, it says, by beholding, we become changed. So if you want to grow spiritually, put your mind in touch with God through his word. Commit your life to doing whatever God says in his word. And as God reveals light to you, do that. John 12, 35, Jesus says, walk while you have the light. Jeremiah 15, verse 16, Jeremiah says, thy words were found and I did eat them. So John, the Bible becomes the very basis of our spiritual growth. 
Now, let me ask you what I think might be a pretty fundamental question, but really a very important one. Last question for you. Tell me why you believe or why it is important to pursue spiritual growth. My expectation is that there's a lot of people who feel like they're just fine or they'd be surprised after knowing God for so long that they might want to grow. So uh, why is it important to continue to pursue spiritual growth? Well, it's like this. If you do not exercise your muscles atrophy, In other words, if you don't get any physical exercise, your body deteriorates. So the question that I can reach a certain plateau in my spiritual life and stay there is not true. I'm either growing spiritually or I'm dying spiritually. So the reason to pursue spiritual growth is because it enables us to be spiritually fresh and spiritually alive. In addition to that, pursuing spiritual growth enables us to have things that God wants us to have in a much broader way. In other words, when we pursue spiritual growth, we indeed see Christianity in much broader terms, in much greater terms. What Jesus has for you, those of you that are watching today, as you listen to Pastor John speak, there's more light for you. There's more truth for you. God has greater heights for you. And as you approach these presentations of Pastor John's with an open mind, with a willing spirit, you will grow spiritually to a deeper joy, a greater meaning, a deeper purpose in your life than you can possibly imagine. Let the Lord speak to you as you hear Pastor John. Mark Finley, I can't say thank you enough. I deeply appreciate you taking your time. Thank you. God bless you. Dr. Mark Finley, so glad that he uh, joined us tonight. What a blessing to have him on Hope Awakens. Let's pray together before we begin to open up the Bible and hear the voice of God speak. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, with grateful hearts, we approach your throne of grace. We want to grow spiritually. So let that be so tonight as your spirit leads us. Let your word be alive. Give us that willing spirit that we just heard about. Speak now, we ask you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Early this year, the Gallup organization announced that for the 18th year in a row, nurses ranked number one in their annual poll of most trusted professions. 85% of people said they trusted nurses. I don't know about the other 15%, what they had against nurses, but that's a pretty high approval rate. Second on that list, Engineers, trusted by 66% of people. Then medical doctors, then pharmacists, and then dentists. Police were next. At the bottom of the list, car salespeople, trusted by less than one person in 10. Politicians were only just higher. Now, this particular poll didn't include firefighters. And many polls have shown that firefighters are the most trusted professionals globally. They are admired and appreciated. They are trusted. Thank you, firefighters. But it's not always easy to know who to trust or when to trust. Back in 1957, on the first day of April, the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, announced that Swiss farmers were harvesting a bumper spaghetti crop. Footage was shown of Swiss people pulling spaghetti down out of trees. The BBC's viewers were impressed, and many of them called the BBC, asking how they could get their own spaghetti trees. The switchboard operators at the Beeb told callers to place a sprig of spaghetti in a tin of tomato sauce and hope for the best. While we know that spaghetti is made from wheat and does not grow on trees, most British people at the time, remember 1957, didn't have a clue about spaghetti. It wasn't widely eaten in Britain at the time. And this was the BBC. The presenter was greatly respected. And remember what day this happened on? It was April Fool's Day. Fake news has become a thing in recent years, but fake news isn't new by any means. A challenge we have is that we are wired to believe, especially if the one doing the telling is someone we think we should believe in. In 1964, a 28-year-old bar manager was attacked and killed late one night in Queens, New York. That's the Unisphere you see there, and in the background, the old Shea Stadium. 
The New York Times reported that 38 people saw or heard the murder and did nothing. Other reports said that people stood by and watched the terrible crime take place right in front of their eyes and wouldn't make a move. It was called the crime that changed America. People were horrified by this. What in the world was the country coming to? And that, I think, was the right question to ask. What was America coming to? When a newspaper like the venerable New York Times could publish a story in which almost nothing was true. The one sad truth was that Kitty Genovese lost her life. But apart from that, there were not 38 witnesses to the murder. There were, in fact, none. Some neighbors did hear her cry out for help, but it was 3.30 in the morning. Most of those who heard didn't realize it was a cry for help. One man went to his window, shouted at the attacker, and the man actually got in his car and drove away. But he returned and, well, of course, it was a terrible tragedy. But the facts that are remembered today by millions of people simply are not fact. And that can happen. Deception isn't new and it's everywhere. In March of 2018, Richard Phillips walked out of a Michigan prison after spending 45 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. You see, a witness lied. Another man later admitted to having committed the crime. You want to be able to trust, but we've learned that the people who call you from out of the blue and tell you there's money waiting for you if you'll just send a couple of thousand dollars, scams every time. We've learned that when you get a bargain at a tourist market far from home, there's a very good chance you are wasting your money on a cheap imitation of the real thing. In 2009, the perpetrator of the largest financial fraud in American history was sentenced to 150 years in prison. Prosecutors say he defrauded people of almost $65 billion. People trusted he was handling their money right. He was not. Fortunes, life savings, lost. We are programmed to trust, which is why you believe a television report saying spaghetti grows on trees. This happens in church, you know, and Jesus knew it. It's why he said in Matthew 24, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. So how are we to handle that? I'll tell you. You check. You verify, verify what you're told in church, verify what you're told by well-meaning church members. We can't afford to be fooled. The Bible is the Word of God. Someone's opinion, a video on YouTube, that's not the Word of God. Read the Bible and believe that. How many wise men visited Jesus after He was born? How many? Let's count them. One, two. In actual fact, the Bible doesn't tell us. Where did they visit him? At the manger, right? Nope, at a house. Matthew 2 verse 11 says, And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. The wise men didn't arrive until after Jesus' birth. The animals went on the ark two by two, except, of course, they didn't. The unclean animals went on two by two, but the clean animals went on by sevens. Here's Genesis 7 and verse 2. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female. Two each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female. But we get told things and we believe them to be true. People used to believe the earth is flat. Of course, there's no truth to that. People used to believe spiders have six legs. They have eight. Contrary to popular belief, George Washington never did cut down a cherry tree. And Albert Einstein wasn't bad at mathematics. Have you ever taken a good long look at what you believe? Look at these two lines. Now tell me which one is longest. Of course, you're thinking the vertical line is longer than the horizontal line, when in actual fact, they are the same length. It's interesting that we can see something right in front of us and miss reality. Happens all the time. We can be fooled by what we see or by what we are told. Sometimes the facts are not what they appear. You might have seen an illusionist saw somebody in half, put the lovely assistant in a closet, turn the closet around and the person is gone. But of course, they're only illusions. So what happens when things aren't as they appear in church? Can you imagine people being deceived in church? Well, we know it happens. 
The preacher claims to be healing people. He says there's a man with a brown jacket on. He has a heart condition. He should come forward for prayer because God wants to heal him. Well, it turns out there is a man wearing a brown jacket. He does have a heart condition. He does come forward for prayer. And the preacher knows this because his wife was back there speaking into a microphone, feeding the information into a monitor in his ear and telling him so. And no, the man was not healed, but the people didn't know that. A 10-year-old boy and his dad wrote a book in which they described the boy visiting heaven after an accident. The young lad speaks of the wonders of what he saw and experienced. And then later, after the book had sold a million copies, it was admitted the story was a fabrication. I think we'd agree it's important to believe that many things are true. Unfortunately, though, many people are told things that are not true. Many believe God to be a tyrant. The Bible says God is love. You see, what we know is that there are spiritual forces in the world that want you to believe a lie. They want you to believe the wrong thing about God. We see this graphically illustrated. The book of Revelation talks about a time of real controversy in the end of time. It would especially affect Christians living in the latter days of Earth's history. Revelation 12, 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Notice it says, which deceives the whole world. Now that would include you and me. So we would want to be alert and mindful and careful. What would Satan have to do to deceive someone? Well, he'd have to lead them away from the Bible. This book is our security. David said God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. If we follow that, we're on the right path. John 8 says, if you continue, if you continue or abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Truth is absolutely vital. Being able to trust God is vital. What if you couldn't trust God? And why do we think that we can? Well, in Daniel chapter two, God predicted the rise of four world ruling kingdoms. A king had a dream. He dreamed of an image, a statue, an idol. The head was made of gold. The chest and arms were made of silver. The midsection was of brass. The feet were of iron and clay. And history bears out that what God predicted has really happened. The head of gold represented Babylon. We know that because Daniel said to the king, you are this head of gold. The chest and arms of silver represent Medo-Persia. And we know that because it says so in Daniel chapter eight. The midsection of brass, that's Greece. Daniel 8 names Greece as the next kingdom. Then the legs of iron, that's Rome. You read this amazing prophecy and you have to come to the conclusion that God can be trusted. In Matthew 24, Jesus gave a number of signs of His appearing. Those have been fulfilling. Many, many prophecies about Jesus have been fulfilled. Prophecies in the Psalms, in the book of Isaiah, in Zechariah in other places. So we have good reason to trust God. But let me ask you, when you trust God, what's that going to look like? I can tell you I trust you, but if you cook me dinner and then I feed some of the food to your cat and wait to see if the cat survives or not before I eat, that would indicate that I don't really trust you. You know those group exercises where someone falls backwards and is caught in the arms of the rest of the group? What's that about? That's about trust. If one of the participants refuses to do that, it would seem that he or she doesn't trust that the rest of the group will catch him. What does trust look like when it comes to God? What would faith look like in today's challenging times? We right now are looking into the future. And for some people, it appears to be really bleak people out of work, people sick and dying, people watching their businesses sit idle while the bills mount up. So what would faith look like for us? Of course, each person's situation differs, but let's consider some of the promises God makes. In Proverbs chapter three, we read, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. God says He'll direct you. And so you would then believe that He will. In fact, 
you'd expect that He will. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So, faith would then believe that God would supply your needs. And in fact, faith would expect that God would supply your needs because God has said He would and you trust Him. In fact, you can see this play out in many Bible stories. Now imagine this. As far as we can ascertain from the Bible, it had never rained, ever. No one had ever carried an umbrella. And God says to Noah, it's going to rain. Water will fall from the sky. In fact, a lot of water will cascade down out of the heavens. Noah believes God. Why wouldn't he? But then God says, now it isn't going to rain yet, not for many years. So in the meantime, I want you to build a very large boat. Noah had been told by God it was going to rain. We know from the story that people didn't believe Noah. So as the world watches on, Noah builds a boat, an ark as we refer to it. You can imagine the ridicule. Rain, Noah. We haven't had rain around here since, well, since never. But Noah went right ahead and he built the ark. Why was that? Because God had spoken to him and he believed God. And then he demonstrated that belief, that trust, by acting on what God said. It's going to rain, and I believe God. And even though there has never been rain before, and even though virtually everyone alive thinks I'm out of my mind, I will go ahead and build an ark. Then he took it a step further, went out and gathered animals, two of the unclean, seven of the clean, and they came to the ark and got on board. And that's because when you trust God, you're willing to act upon what He says. Hebrews 11.7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of things not yet seen, divinely warned, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Noah believed God and demonstrated that belief by acting on what God said. That was faith. That was trust. Now, I'll give you an example of trust and distrust. God had angels speak to Lot who lived in Sodom. The angel said, God is going to destroy these cities, leave, get out of town, and when you do, don't look back. So Lot gathered his family and they left and they didn't look back. Jude verse 7 says that Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around about them suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. But there was one exception, someone who evidently didn't really trust God. God had told them all, don't look back. But Mrs. Lot, Mrs. Lot looked back behind and she became a pillar of salt. Those who trusted God acted on what He said. Mrs. Lot, different story. Hebrews 11 is known as the Bible's faith chapter. In verse 30, it says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. God had told Joshua to walk with his army around Jericho once a day for six days. On the seventh day, God said, you shall march around the city seven times and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. And the wonder of it all is that's exactly what Joshua and the people did. Can you imagine being told to do that and then actually doing that? If I told told you to walk around your local Walmart each day, then seven times on a certain day and then blow a ram's horn and shout and that when you did the whole place would fall over flat, you would think I'd lost it. But when God told Joshua to lead his armies to do just that, they did it. Why would that be? Because Joshua trusted God. And why was that? Because Joshua had got to know God. And he knew that when God spoke, the best thing he could do would be to follow God's leading. I'll give you another example. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. 
Abraham lived in a place called Ur, down near the Persian Gulf in southern Iraq. That's what we call it today. God said to him, Abraham, it's time for you to leave. Where am I going? I can't tell you, God says, but I will lead you. You just follow me and I will lead you to where you're going. And Abraham followed God. He didn't even know where he was going, but he knew that God was leading and that was enough. That's trust. That's faith. It's not just that he didn't know where he was going. He left his home, his extended family, his livelihood. He left it all to follow a God he couldn't see to a place he didn't even know of. Ah, but this wasn't a God Abraham didn't know, and that's significant. But as you know, it gets even deeper for Abraham. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 17, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. This is a remarkable story. A devout believer of God is asked by God to do something that only a pagan would do, to sacrifice your son, unfathomable. But Abraham knew that God was asking him to do this. And so he trusted God and his trust in God was vindicated. Now, word of caution, people have done some regrettable things because they thought God was asking them to do so. Could be because of a couple of reasons, could be Uh, emotional instability, or could be because that person didn't really know God and was misled. Abraham knew God, and that close relationship with God led him to trust God and willingly do what he was asked. You know, the once popular psychologist, Dr. Joyce Brothers, TV personality, author, columnist, she got a PhD from Columbia University. She once said, the best proof of love is trust. Abraham loved God and so he trusted God. The same was true for Noah and Gideon. Gideon started with an army of 32,000. And even with that army, he was hopelessly outnumbered. But by the time God was done with Gideon's army, there were only 300 soldiers left. And God said, now with 300 men, go fight the Midianites. And Gideon did just that. It was a suicide mission, except that he knew God was with him. When he knew it was God making the request, he trusted God and followed God's leading. Now, let's see if we can follow God's leading. Like Noah, we don't want to be sidetracked by the crowd. We can't be led to look back even if family members want to look back. We want God to be our guide. Now, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now that's the fourth commandment. And why did God give it to the human family? He knew we would need time out from the busyness of life. He knew we'd need to connect with each other. He knew people would need time to connect with God. And He gave the Sabbath as a memorial, a memorial of creation and a sign of God's power to create and recreate. In the little town where I grew up, there's a war memorial. In fact, On that war memorial are the names of those from our town who died serving their country. That memorial called us to remember what these men had done. That's what memorials do. They call us to to remember important things and important people, important relationships. God gave us the seventh-day Sabbath as a memorial, calling us to keep forever in mind that He is our creator and recreator. And it shouldn't surprise anyone that this sign of God's creative power, this sign of His ownership of the world would come under dispute. The Sabbath encourages us to spend time with God and to remember our relationship with Him. God gave the Sabbath to the human family back at creation. It wasn't only Jewish. It was given more than 2,000 years before the first Jew existed. God's people kept the Sabbath as they wandered in the wilderness. 
when they settled in the promised land and when Jesus was on earth, He and His followers did the same. Today, more than ever, we should see the value of rest, of coming aside, of stepping back, of making more room in our lives for what really matters. This was a gift given by a God who knew what He was doing, by a God who loves communion and fellowship. God evidently craves spending time with us. Think about that. What does that tell you about God? He has a universe so vast we can't comprehend, and yet He delights to to spend time with us. That's fantastic. So if the Sabbath was changed, that'd be colossal. You remember that in the Bible, they accused Jesus and His disciples of failing to give the Sabbath proper respect? They were furious to the extent they wanted to kill Jesus for that. Can you imagine if all of a sudden a sect rose up and ignored the Sabbath altogether in that environment? That would be huge. There would have been a civil war, you would think. So one would think that if God's own law was going to be changed, if there was going to be some sort of constitutional amendment regarding the Ten Commandments, the Bible would have to say something about it. God says to us, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What do we say about that? It's clear. You find it in the Bible. Easy. But the reality is not everyone is enthusiastic about that. Not everyone in your family might be supportive of that. It might even be that where you worship, people don't agree with God on this one, even though it's right here in the Bible. Today, most people would think of the Sabbath as the Christian day of rest. They'd think of it as Sunday. But is Sunday in the Bible as a holy day? The truth is, no, it's not. If Sunday really is the Christian day of rest, then the Bible would definitely say so. But in the New Testament, Sunday's hardly mentioned. The Sabbath is mentioned many times. But Sunday? Look at this, John 20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, now that's Sunday, when the, dis- when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. There was a gathering for what reason? For fear of the Jews, certainly not to celebrate the resurrection. They didn't believe the resurrection had even taken place. In 1 Corinthians 16, we read this. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, Sunday, lead each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. No, this wasn't anything to do with taking an offering in church. Paul asked believers in Corinth to put money aside every first day of the week for believers suffering due to a time of famine and hardship. This was a collection being taken up for other believers who were struggling financially. And when I say collection, when Paul sent somebody, he would collect the money that people had set aside at home. Paul says, after the Sabbath is over, decide what you can spare for fellow believers. And you'll notice he was writing to the Corinthians. What did Paul do when he was with the Corinthians? Acts 18 tells us, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. While he was in Corinth, Paul kept the Sabbath. He sure wasn't going to write to them and say, You can forget about it now. In Acts 20, we find a situation where Paul had just traveled from Philippi to Troas. It says in the Bible, Now on the first day of the week, Sunday again, When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. The moral of the story is... Don't fall asleep in church. They were having a preaching service on the first day. They broke bread. They did that just about every day, not just the Sabbath day. This was Paul's last day with them, which is why he preached so long. He eats, sleeps, and then the next day walks 14 miles to catch a ship. When did he do this? If it was nighttime and if it was the first day of the week, this was Saturday night. 
How do we know that? Because in the Bible, a day is measured from sunset to sunset. After the sun sets, a new day begins from a biblical vantage point. So it's the first day and it's dark that Saturday night. Sunday night would have been the second day of the week. So on Saturday night, Paul preaches, Eutychus falls out of church, and the next day, Sunday, Paul walks more than a half marathon to go and catch a boat. This doesn't show Sunday as sacred. It shows the opposite. The Sabbath day points us to Jesus, the one who created this earth back in the beginning. Why would we want to forget that? In these final days of earth's history, there's a call to worship Him. Revelation 14, the final gospel message to go to the world says, Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. That's a call to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In fact, the angel there in Revelation 14 uses the same language as used in the Sabbath commandment. It's clear that God is calling us back to something we've forgotten to remember. Where else do you read about it in the Bible? New Testament, Luke 4, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. You can read in Matthew 24 where Jesus explicitly said the Sabbath would be kept after he died and went to heaven. Pray that your flight would not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. That's what Jesus said. Looking ahead 40 years, Jesus was talking about something long after His death. And He said that in that day, God's day would still be important. You read in Revelation 1.10, the Lord has a day. And you read in the Bible where the disciples certainly could not have changed the Sabbath day. They said, we ought to obey God rather than men. You see, what makes it important is that it's important to God. God gave it. Jesus observed it. Jesus showed it's important to Him. If it's important to Jesus, it's got to be important to us. Imagine Jesus dying on the cross and saying, this is important to me. Wouldn't it then be important to you? So I think what we need to wrestle with is this change. How did the change come about? If the Bible doesn't sanction the change, who did? Well, I can tell you the change happened gradually. In the fourth century, the emperor of the Roman Empire was a man named Constantine. His empire was fractured. And as part of an effort to unite his empire, he passed a law that sought to unite everyone religiously. Here's part of an edict he issued. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let shops be closed. A commandment of God was changed by the government of the Roman Empire in an effort to unite pagans and Christians in Constantine's kingdom. It wasn't changed by Jesus. It wasn't changed by His disciples. A gradual change took place. And this then entered into the practice of the church of the day. Eventually, the modern church claimed the credit for making the change. From a church teaching book, we read this. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Here's the answer. Because the Catholic church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, I'm not saying this with criticism in my heart. This is simply a matter of the historical record. But does any church have the authority to change God's law? No. But down through the years, owing largely to the influence of tradition, this practice became entrenched in Christianity. In a book called Catholicism and Fundamentalism, written by Carl Keating, a former lawyer, a man with a JD at least, very smart fellow, you read on page 38, fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday. Yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath or day of rest was, of course, Saturday. He says, It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. Now, let me me mention this to you. The Bible nowhere says we should honor the resurrection by changing the Sabbath day. 
Baptism signifies the resurrection. The Lord's Supper, we show forth His death and resurrection. But if you think, I keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection, there is no biblical support for that at all. One cardinal said this, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures, he said, enforce the religious observance of Saturday. You find that in a book called The Faith of Our Fathers. And that's where Sunday came from. Did it come from the Bible? No. Instead, it slipped into the church through the back door into Christianity and it came from tradition. Are all traditions bad things? No. Thanksgiving in the United States, that's a good tradition. Anzac Day in Australia and New Zealand, that's a good tradition. In Britain and other countries, the Boxing Day holiday, December 26, that's a tradition and a good one. But a tradition that usurps the place of a commandment of God, it's not hard to see problems there. Now, I know that sometimes this question can come close to a person, but the answer really isn't difficult. Who made us? Jesus. Who suffered for us? Jesus. Who died for us? Jesus. Who rose for us? Jesus. Who has redeemed us? Jesus has. When you trust Him, you desire to accept Him into your heart, there isn't anything you wouldn't surrender to Him. Trust is a really good demonstration of love. So we have to ask ourselves what the foundation of our faith is. And will we settle on what God says or on what people say? Sometimes it isn't easy to see something because of our history or because of what we see other people doing. Remember the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. What's faith? Relying on the Word of God, trusting it will do what it says it will do because it's the Word of God. Remember what Jesus said, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. So the one who is moved by love for God is going to want to live for the one who died for us. Here's where we see the importance of faith. That Joyce Brothers quote rings in my ears. The best proof of love is trust. Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. What do they do? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This isn't a matter of days. It's a matter of surrender. Now, someone's going to tell you, you can pick whatever day you like, as though the seventh commandment is up for grabs too, and you can pick whatever person you like. Isn't that something like what happened in the Garden of Eden? Eve, you can eat from whatever tree you want. It's the same thing. I was driving on a freeway one morning, and I realized I was going to be in a bit of trouble. I had to return a rental car, then catch the shuttle to the airport, which was all good, except time was a little bit tight and I couldn't remember where the rental car place was. I knew what to do. I called my wife. I said, here's where I am. Here's where I'm going. Please find where I am. Find where I'm going on the map and then direct me to the rental car place. She said, all right, I see you. Well, I see on the map about where you are. I see where the rental car place is. She said, keep on going and then get ready to take a left. But that would be to turn south and the rental car agency was to the north. And everyone knows that would necessitate a right turn. So I checked with Melissa. Are you sure? She said, yes. You need to take a left turn on the certain road. I said, the sign says that road is coming up in one mile. I don't have much time. I need you to find that right turn I need because I can't afford to drive miles out of my way. Calmly, she said, take the left turn, John. I said, are you sure? She said, you're forgetting something. I can see the big picture. Ah, so I took the left turn, drove about a quarter of a mile, and what do you know? The road turned off to the right, came right back around, went north, and took me straight to my destination. My wife had saved the day. Again, she could see the big picture. It's the same in our relationship with God. God can see the big picture. The big picture, encompassing eternity, encompassing real faith. Today, you'll hear voices telling you to do this or believe that, but the voice to listen to is the voice of God. Following the leading of God, that's what we call faith. It's trust, like Noah building that ark. Even when it might seem 
unlikely, you can trust God with everything. Jesus is going to return to this earth. We think that's going to be soon, but we freely admit we don't know how soon soon is. But whenever Jesus comes back, we want him dwelling in us, living in us, doing heaven's will in our lives. Remember Joshua's words, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When Jesus has your life, he's going to live in you more and more and more. You'll grow and you can trust God with your whole heart. Trust God with your whole life that trust will be demonstrated like it was in Abraham's day, in Gideon's day. When Jesus comes back, what a day. And I wanna give you the opportunity tonight to make a decision for Jesus, to make a decision for eternity. Jesus trusted his father as he died on the cross. We can trust our heavenly father as we live on this earth. I want you to make a decision tonight. To do so, you're gonna have to text me. Here's my number, 423 264-2575. Send me a text message. Send me the word REST, R-E-S-T. And when you do, I send you a question. Grab your phone and send me a text message. My number, 423-264-2575. The message I want you to send me is REST, R-E-S-T. That's all. And when you send me that, I'll send you a message back. And that message will say this. Listen. I choose to worship him who made heaven and earth by keeping the seventh day Sabbath. And then you send me a reply. You can say, no, I'm not interested. Or you can send a reply that says, yes, because you are interested. You trust God and you want that trust to be seen in your life. When you send that answer to me, I'll text you again. This text message from me to you will say, I have questions I would like to ask. Just let me know. Say no if you don't have any questions, but have a question about this topic or any topic at all. Text me the word yes, and then I'll be able to get in touch with you. And if I can't get in touch with you, I'll ask one of my team helpers to get in touch with you about a question that you might have. And then after you answer that second question, I'll send you another one. How may we pray for you? And you can text back whatever you'd like us to pray for you about. Call me, not call me, text me. Area code 423-264-2575. Send me the word yes. I'll send you a question. You answer that, I'll send you a second. You answer that, I'll send you a third. That's what I want you to do. And by the way, check your email because my team might have emailed you some resources from Hope Awakens and we don't want that going to your spam folder. Would you make a decision for Jesus tonight? Would you do that? Text me on that number, 423-264-2575. Let me pray for you now. Our Father in heaven, give us grace to make a decision for now and forever. A decision that will demonstrate trust for you in our lives. Thank you for your gifts and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Be sure you go to hopeawakens.org. You'll find all sorts there, including resources. See you next time for our next presentation right here at Hope Awakens. Thanks for joining me.